Hi, beautiful people. Welcome to the Fort Salem Library, where we read you your fanfiction. So sit down or don't, relax or don't, and enjoy these stories in a way you have not before. We at Fort Salem Library do not own Motherland Fort Salem or any of the related characters. The Motherland Fort Salem series is created by Elliot Lawrence and owned by Freeform. This story is a work of fan fiction and is meant for entertainment only. We are not making any profit from these stories. All rights of the original Motherland Fort Salem story belong to Freeform. We also do not own Fireside or any of its original characters and storylines. We did, however, get permission from the author to read their story. This story was created and written by Guess Who, and you can find the link in our show notes. This story is being read to you by me, Britt. Fireside Chapter 1 The Ball The bathroom door wrenches open, and Tally bounds out like an excited child. In her evergreen faux-rab midi dress and holly crown, cheeks flushed pink with excitement as she twirls through the room. She positively glows. Abigail turns from their full-length mirror, resplendent in a high-necked cranberry dress with lantern sleeves and butterscotch trim. A small golden tiara sits nestled in her hair, catching the light in glints and sparkles. Gold eyeshadow makes her eyes shine as bright as her white teeth when she smiles like the soon-reborn sun and snaps her fingers in time with her words. Okay, serve it, she says. Work, work, work. Tally dances towards her on each snapping beat. A little shimmy here, a booty pop there, grinning all the while. She giggles and grabs Abigail's hands, bounces on the balls of her still bare feet. I'm so excited. No way, Abigail teases. I can't tell at all. Tally's grin is goofy, her dimples full and deep. She opens her mouth to reply, only to be cut off by the sound of their door opening. When Rayel enters, already dressed and carrying a chilled can of Mountain Dew from the only vending machine on base, both Abigail and Tally begin to snap. Oh, okay, Rayel says, and start dancing towards them, in her midnight blue suit and heels sipping her sofa with each step and sway. The pear-colored button-up under her fitted jacket hugs her like a second skin, and her hair, longer now than it's ever been, is unbraided and slicked back, calling sharp attention to her eyes, now sea-foam and bright. In a tight circle, the three dance together, snapping and popping and giggling like thrilled little girls. We look amazing, you guys, Tally squeals and claps her hands, then yanks them both in by their necks. Tally, my hair, Abigail says, and Tally quickly frees them from the embrace. I'm sorry. Abigail stiffens as if her mother has just appeared out of nowhere to chastise her for poor posture. She clears her throat, smooths her dress, and very seriously says, Okay, now, ladies. Faces. Tally immediately mimics Abigail's posture and expression, though a smile teases at her lips, her dimples still sunken in as if they've joyful mind of their own. She smacks Rael, who rolls her eyes but matches their form all the same. Once they're all at attention, Abigail nods firmly and says, Now, when we enter the hall, remember, we are poise. We are power. She grins like the devil. We are pure, unadulterated sex. Tally blushes. Rael scoffs. You know it's you, right? Not Beltane? Every day is Beltane, if you believe. Abigail says, then grabs her unnaturally high heels and begins strapping them on. Do you think the general will come? Tally asks without thought. Her mouth quickly forms an O-shape, and the red in her cheeks deepens until it matches the shade of her loosely curled and flowing hair. I don't know, Tally, Abigail says pointedly. Will she be coming? A garbled gurgle breaks the air as Riel chokes on her Mountain Dew. It dribbles from her nose and down her chin as she jerks the can away from her face and coughs. Damn it, Bells! To answer your question, Abigail says, ignoring the mess she's caused. Yes, the general will be there. She always makes an appearance at the Yule Ball. 
but she doesn't dance or feast or anything. She just shows up, looks fabulous as per usual, then leaves again. Oh, Tally says, trying to keep the disappointment curling through her chest from slipping up into her voice. She hears it anyway. So does Abigail. Don't pout, she says. Alder hates balls. That should make you happy, Tally, considering you have none. Riel chokes on her soda again and spews. Oh, sorry, Abigail says, not even the slightest bit sorry. Are we still pretending Tally hasn't been walking around base with a massive lady boner for Alder since the day she was unbiddied? Before, if we're being honest, Riel says as she wipes Mountain Dew from her face with her bedsheet. Seriously, Tally, Abigail says as she checks herself one less time in the mirror. I think you're supposed to call the number on the back of the box if the erection lasts more than four hours. Riel absolutely cackles at that. So hard she wheezes herself into utter silence, just lies shaking on top of her bed like a leaf clinging to a winter branch. It's been what? Abigail asks. Four months? Five? Stop! Tally whines. Now as red as Abigail's dress, her posture puddles and she slowly sinks to the floor, hoping to disappear. It's not like that, you guys. Oh, it's 100% like that, Rael says, finally regaining her composure. Trust me. I will not, Tally says firmly and juts her chin in defiance. You know nothing, Rael Collar. Gays know everything, Abigail says and crosses to the door. Rael jumps up, chugs down the last of her drink, then tosses the can in the bin beside her bed. It's true, she says, then belches unapologetically. Sweet goddess, no, Abigail admonishes, absolutely offended as she turns from the door to face her. What did I just say, shitbird? Poise, power, sex, no belching anywhere on the list. Right, right, Riel rolls her eyes again. No perfectly normal bodily functions, got it. Tally, despite being mortified, laughs and forces herself up again to join them at the door. Her evergreen heels hang from her fingertips by the straps, gorgeous but horribly uncomfortable. She's determined to wait until the last possible second to don them. Why don't we just go, she asks, and never speak of what we just spoke about again. She slips right past the other two and flings open the door again. With a quick, pointed glance back at them, she adds, like, ever, and does her best not to windstrike them both when they follow her out in annoyingly harmonized laughter. Fort Salem's formal banquet hall is massive and high-ceilinged, and every inch of the space is decked in the most brilliant, rich greens and reds. The walls and open air above their heads are strong with fairy lights, more effulgent than can be natural. Magnified by work that Tally can see dancing around their thin strings and cords, like brilliant little swatches of collar. Mistletoe hangs from kissing boughs posted at entrances and exits and massive Holly King and Oak King effigies fill the spaces between the goddesses' ritual offering shrines, painting each of the hall's four large corners. And in the center of it, the dazzlingly adorned yule tree stretches up towards the ceiling, like a green, red, and gold spire reaching into the sky. And it takes Telly's breath away. She only has moments to appreciate the sight, however, before she's being dragged by her sisters, towards a seemingly endless amount of flickering candles, and hearthy fair adorning a collection of gold-clotted tables lined against one long wall. One table, the one Abigail immediately gravitates toward, is little more than an extensive and impressive assemblage of festive alcoholic beverages from various places around the world. There's eggnog, and eierlikur, seyungwa, and salep, conquito, and compote and colimono, palm wine and rice wine, and poppy seed milk. The options are endless, and Tally has no idea where to start. A predicament that lasts only seconds before Abigail is shoving a steaming hot mug of something into her hand and telling her to drink. She does, and instantly feels her belly stir, warm and delighted. Cinnamon pops and melts on her tongue, and she smiles. Now what? Now we dance, Abigail says. Downs a glass of sorrel like a shot, then downs a second. She grabs one of Tally's hands and one of Riel's and drags them both towards the dance floor, circling the gargantuan yule tree. The live band, 
a four-person, all-girl, all-witch group from Denmark, known as Costas Kafterne, rocks the hall with up-tempo beats that, when paired with the creamy alcohol now settling in her stomach, makes Telly feel like she's positively on fire. The music pumps through the air and through her blood. She doesn't even have to think. All she has to do is move, feel, dance. The three dance like they are timeless, a perfect tripod definition of youth and energy, and Tally feels more alive than she has in months. She can feel hands on her, spinning and dipping her, and twirling her off to the next. Abigail's hands, Riel's, then M's, Gregorio's, Glory's, more and more as the night blooms. And before they know it, the dance floor is absolutely packed. By the time the music shudders to a stop, the band ready for its first break, Tally is gasping for air and smiling like she's made of sunshine, sweating as if she's been standing in the shine for days. Her makeup is runny, and the tender curls in her hair have deflated a bit, but the joy buzzing through her system gives her no room to care. That is, until Rael's hand lands on her lower back, and her voice slithers over Tally's ear like a sinful secret that makes Tally's entire body still. Look who's finally here. Tally's gaze shoots towards the hall's grand entrance. In its open mouth, framed by holly, and centered under an absurdly enormous pine wreath, sends General Sarah Alder in all her glory. And every single drop of liquid in Tally's body croaks into air and ash as she takes into sight. She's not sure what she was expecting. But it certainly wasn't Sarah Alder in tailored by the goddess herself peridot suit pants and the matching jacket with no shirt on underneath, just a massive snow quartz pendant hanging from a golden chain around her neck and settling right between the barely visible swell of her bare breasts. Solid white pumps to match her pendant. Blue eyes almost unnaturally bright under deep green eyeshadow. Cheeks blush just enough to make her angles even more severe than usual. Her hair lays in a loose, ivy lace braid over one shoulder, and her long, pointed fingernails are painted in alternating shades of moss and ivory. And Tally can't fucking breathe, Tell, Riel says and chuckles. She rubs soothing circles into Tally's lower back that, blessedly, keep Tally upright. I have to admit, though, I'm pretty shook myself. I mean, that is sex in a suit right there. Abigail appears at their side, as if summoned by Tally's immediate and mortifying arousal, and flashes the same devilish grin she'd worn in the dorm. Tally, your boner is showing. Flanking her like a sweet, innocent sentinel, Isadil, who Tally hadn't even realized had arrived. He wears a butterscotch linen suit and cranberry scarf and chokes on his eggnog as Abigail's words echo through the now quiet space, much louder than intended. He splutters as Abigail slaps a hand over his mouth. Rael brays like a fucking donkey, and Tally's entire soul leaves her body. Every set of eyes in the building is now fixed on the four of them, or more pointedly, on Tally. On the intersection of her thighs, specifically, as if they can't help but seek out this supposed obvious boner of hers. No gaze is more searing or particular than that of the woman still occupying the hall's entrance. Tally watches as Sarah Alder's singular focus devours her from across the room. From the tips of Tally's holly crown, down the length of her auburn hair, tomato red face and neck, and every flowing line of her evergreen gown, down, down, down to heeled, pinched feet and slowly back up. When her eyes lock hard on Tally's, one brow cracking the stillness to inch up toward her hairline, all the air seems to be suctioned from the room because Tally's lungs are wheezing for a breath that simply won't come. And then... Happy Yule, everyone! Oh. Oh. Tally could kiss Glory. The tension in the room crackles into ease again as Glory's words evoke echoes and cheers, and then suddenly, the air is back. Chatter ripples through it in waves, clumps louder in some places like buzzing swarm of bees, and Tally can hear and see it all, and best of all, she can breathe again. It's ragged and lacking rhythm, and yeah, maybe it doesn't soothe her at all, but it's there, it's in her lungs. It's keeping her conscious and alive, which is quite the feat when faced with such a heart-stopping sight as General Alder in a sex goddess costume. It's a suit, actually, Riel says. 
but I know what you mean. Tally blinks and briefly blacks out as she realizes she had just said some of all of that aloud. But then Rael is choking on her own laugh and forcing Tally aware again. When she blinks back into sound and color, she finds herself suddenly face to face with the suit-clad sex goddess herself. The general seven biddies flank her in a clean row, each in dress uniform with holly, pine, ivy, and crystal embellishments glinting from their sleeves and lapels, their necks, ears, and hair. Together, they are as an embellishment themselves. Sarah Alder's finest jewels. Cadets, General Alder gives a short nod, then glances briefly to Adil and nods again to him. When her eyes return to Tally, her brow is still arched, the sight tugging at Tally's stomach as if the two are tied together. One corner of the general's mouth twitches with mirth. Though she has the grace and decorum to say nothing of the earlier debacle. Her gaze never once leaves Tally as she says, You all look splendid. You look amazing, Tally blurts, then immediately squeaks like a mouse caught in a cookie jar. She glances at Rael, her eyes a clear cry of, Help! But Riel only bugs her own eyes back at her as if to say, What, bitch? All you did was compliment her. Calm down. Um, you really do, General, Abigail says, trying to help where she had earlier humiliated, and Telly still kind of wants to pinch her, or punch her, softly on the arm. General Alder watches Telly a moment longer, the humor twitching at the edges of her mouth now tugging harder and harder. She's as near to a smile as Telly has seen her in ages, when she finally looks away. Thank you both, she says, and glances about the room as if she cares to know who's in attendance. She doesn't. Well, I hope you all enjoy the festivities. Thank you, ma'am, Abigail says, with a still slightly mortified expression. You too. I will, the general replies with another formal dip of her head. Her eyes catch the glimmer of fairy lights and candle glow halos and Tally wonders when gilded cerulean became her favorite color. It had always, always been sunset orange, but now? I will see you all again at Fireside. If not tonight, then certainly I'll make my way around before Yule's end. They each nod their goodbyes as the general drifts away, the biddies flowing behind her like perfect trickling water. Tally waits until the entire collective is out of earshot before... Are you fucking kidding me? The words chatter through Telly's gritted teeth as she whirls on Abigail only to find the girl somehow, inexplicably, already gone. She thinks she sees a flash of cranberry and gold disappearing into a distant section of the ground. And Tally seeds. She turns back to Riel, who wears a constipated, apologetic expression, despite not having done anything worth apologizing for, and awkwardly pats Tally's arm. We all make mistakes, Tell, she says. Telly's eyes twitches. Someone give me more alcohol, she says, voice pouty despite the snarl on her face. She looks like a ginger kitten attempting to roar and only managing a mule. But Riel doesn't say a word, only pats Telly's arm again and pulls her toward the feast tables. Also, Telly says, after chugging a muck of iron liqueur, already overloaded with brandy, then topped with more brandy from the tube-shaped flask hidden inside the head of Gregorio's entirely unnecessarily but stylish cane. What is Fireside? Yule tradition, Sekhmet, Em announces as the small coven files out of the banquet hall, together, and into the freezing winter air. They're a little too loose and liquid on their feet, but clearly feeling fantastic. Tally's drunk enough to have forgiven Abigail and walks with one arm strung around her shoulders, and the others strung around rails. Together, they make their way toward a huge expanse of lawn speckled with large, glowing gazebos. Each gazebo is green and gold, and bears the name of a single coven on its crown. And in the center of the gazebos, pitted floors are crackling, spitting fire surrounded by sitting cushions, loaded snack trays, and goblets nestled around pitchers, presumably filled with something. Tally has no idea what only that she's already thirsty for it. As they each step up into the segment gazebo, Telly is shocked to find it's perfectly warm inside. The structure is entirely open, no walls, and even with a fire, 
the Massachusetts air is frigid enough to cause frostbite. But inside the gazebo, it's cozy, balmy even. And as she settles into the warmth, Telly sees it. The work, invisible if not for her sight, blurring over the open spaces like gossamer curtains. Beautiful. Welcome to Fireside, Em says, as they all take their seats, settling onto the decorous cushions marked individually with their initials. More cushions line the outer edge of the gazebo, but none bear any initials or marks. Extras, Tally assumes. With training and work, witches ensure ourselves capable of conquering almost any challenge. But our greatest strength lies in our bonds. As we enter the darkest part of our year, we are called to this awareness. In darkness, there is no light to guide us, and so we must guide each other. M passes a goblet to each of them then carefully begins filling them with the contents of one of the pitchers. Tally gives it a sniff and is pleased to realize it's red wine. A coven is a family, each witch tethered to the next, and it is only through trust and harmony that we find our way through the darkness. M settles onto their own initial marked cushion. With their full goblet in hand and resting just over their lab, not yet sipped, they continue a rare, soft smile on their face. We do this by making our own light, our own fire, a flame of connection. Here at Fireside, we invest time in nurturing that flame, so that even on the darkest night, we remain bright. Telly smiles, unable to help herself. Her eyes itch with tears as she nearly laughs. The alcohol fizzing and burning in her belly feels good, and she feels happy and emotional and more connected to these witchy people and this witch's place than ever before. Oh, she's alive with it. Goddess, that was good, she says, breathless. Did you memorize that? M snorts and shakes their head, raises their goblet in a toast. Tonight, I drink to this coven, this family. Together, may our voices carry us through this darkest night and keep us long after. To Sekhmet. Happy Yule. Happy Yule! Tally practically screams, and Riel nearly falls over laughing. You'll have to excuse her, Abigail chuckles. She's excited. She's drunk, Tally says happily, and takes a long drink of her wine. No, I'm not, Abigail laughs. I mean, a little buzzed, sure, but I'm good. Telly bumps her knee against Abigail's and grins. I was talking about myself. She was talking about herself, Rael wheezes. Help! So what now? Telly asks as Em refills her goblet for her. Is there a ritual we're supposed to do or something? Not exactly a ritual, Em says. At least, not yet. It's more like a bonding. Like we're going to go around and tell each other about our shitty childhoods, Rael asks. And Telly frowns. Mine was good, she says. I mean, my mom was kind of paranoid, but she makes really good gem. Like, really, really good gem. She takes another drink and sighs happily. I love jam. Riel, her entire life suspended inside one rattling wheeze, is practically in Gregorio's lap as the two of them lean on each other and laugh themselves near sick. Okay, no more wine for you, Em says. Just in case we get our blessing tonight. Blessing? Telly asks, almost absent-mindedly. Her face feels strange, but her head is floaty and nice. Wow. Yule is delightful. The general's blessing, Em says, and Telly is suddenly a full, wide-eyed attention. The general's coming? Abigail snorts into her wine, then winces and pinches her nose. Ow! That went in! She cleanses one of her eyes closed. It burns! It burns! It won't be for a while yet if she does, Em says, ignoring Abigail's unfortunate outburst. She usually shows up around midnight and stays for an hour or two. Two hours? Telly squeaks, and her chest floods with heat. Like, she's just gonna hang out with us for two hours? Well, she gives us each a New Year's blessing, Em says, then a collective blessing for our coven. That's the ritual part, but then after that, basically, yeah. A strangled noise sounds in Tally's throat. Why? 
Because that's the whole point, M says with a laugh and takes Tally's goblet away. It's why we do fireside every night of you. Bonding, Craven. As I said, it's tradition. Trust, harmony, all that good-ish, Gregorio interrupts, then sputters a protest as M quickly snags his goblet as well. The general uses this time to do the same, M says. She spends her fireside with a different war college coven each night, not as a general, but as a fellow witch. A certain amount of decorum is expected, obviously, but the reins are loosened a fair bit, so that we can spend time with her as a person. General Alder believes strongly in this ritual, and in its nurturing of loyalty and care, so I expect each of you to pull yourselves together enough to respect that and to participate without embarrassing the ever-loving shit out of me and this coven. They took a long sip of their wine and smacked their lips together in a way that somehow seems authoritative. That clear? They each nod vigorously, Telly to the point of dizzying herself. It's Rael who breaks the sudden tense silence with, You think Alder wants to talk about her shitty childhood? When she and Gregorio snort themselves into another seemingly endless stream of laughter, Telly turns her attention on him. Are we supposed to ask about stuff like that? She's a little panicked now, way, way overthinking this apparent bro hang they're supposed to have with the General Alder, but she can't stop her mind from reeling. Her thoughts are a strange series of rapid-fire questions and terrified chicken squawks. She has to physically stop from exiting her lips. Are we supposed to ask anything at all? You can ask, Em says, but that doesn't mean she'll answer. Usually the time is spent in conversation, but it's mostly easy, service stuff. Nothing too serious, usually. She's even been known to play games with the covens, especially if the cadets seem nervous to engage with her. Twenty-one questions, two truths and a lie, stuff like that. Just little ways to loosen everyone up and make things fun without sacrificing the getting-to-know-us part. Tally glances to Abigail. She's desperate for someone to anchor her, keep her wild, mad heart from floating right out of her chest. But Abigail's lips are pursed, and her eyes are narrowed, thoughts churning almost visibly behind him. Tally doesn't even want to know. She whirls towards Rael and smacks her shoulder. Did you know this was going to happen? Riel's lips tighten to hold back a laugh. She takes a deep breath through her nose, then, in one long, strained exhale, confesses. Abigail told me earlier, and I wanted to tell you, I swear, but it was funnier not to, so then I just didn't. As Tally gapes and mouths the air like a fish out of water, Em says, Relax, Craven. I told you the general never comes around until midnight. She likes to give us time together first. You've got at least an hour and a half to sober up, just in case tonight's our night. But I wouldn't worry about it too much, honestly. She usually goes in alphabetical order, so we probably won't even see her until the second to last night. Okay, Tally says, choking on the single word. She nods, feeling her breath settle. Her chest relaxes just the slightest bit. Her heart calms. Okay, good. Good, I can prepare. She panics as soon as the words are out of her mouth and quickly corrects. We, we can prepare, all of us, together, for the general. Wow, Abigail says. That was just sad, Tal. Shut up, Tally huffs around an entire mouthful of cheese cubes from the tray nearest her cushion. Good evening, segment coven. A cube of cheese lodges itself viciously in Tally's throat as General Alder's voice suddenly sings through the air. The entire coven jolts, surprised and collectively whirls to face the woman now watching them with amusement, still suited to hell and back and flanked by her equally glamorous biddies. As everyone freezes, each member of segment temporarily struck dumb by the unexpected, expected visit, Telly coughs, violently. Cheese flies from her open lips and disappears into the fire in the center of the gazebo, sizzling to death. Riel and Gregorio quickly clamp hands over each other's mouth as Abigail suddenly pretends to look for something she's not at all lost, and M feigns complete ignorance. Tally closes her mouth and prays for a swift death, and much to her surprise, it's the biddies who deliver her from the awkward tension. The eldest, Blanche, snorts hard, and like a stream of falling dominoes, a laugh is triggered down the line of old women until they are each singing their amusement into the freezing night air. 
Well, on that delightful note, General Alder says with an uncharacteristically wide smile, may we join you? Tally is certain she will not survive the night. And to think she'd been so damned excited at the start of it. Please find a fanfiction you just listened to on Archive of Our Own and leave the author some love. Without them, this wouldn't be possible, and we want to thank them from the bottoms of our hearts for creating these amazing stories and keeping the show alive.